So good evening. My name is Sister Kathy Duffy. I am a professor of uh, physics as well as director of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. And in the name of our president, uh, Sister Carol Jean Vale, and our uh, vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Ken Soprano, who's with us tonight, and in the name of our institute's advisory committee, I would like to welcome you to our Sugarloaf campus and to the third lecture in the institute's spring 2012 series. I'm so glad that you could all come. We have three members, no, three, there might be four, members of our uh, advisory committee here. Let me, don't let me miss anybody. Uh, Ed, um, Ed Devinney, who will be our speaker, uh, Peter Dodson, who those of you who were here last, last week know, and uh, Frank Hoffman from Westchester University, who's here, and uh, Frank Pennington. That's right, he's up here in the front, and suddenly the microphone went away. Thank you. Okay, good. Did I miss anyone? Patrick, Patrick McCauley from Chestnut Hill College. Thank you. Yeah, so we have five, uh, five of our ten uh, advisory uh, members here, so we're very glad for that. As many of you know, the Institute for Religion and Science is continuing the work of the Metanexus Institute of pursuing a constructive dialogue between science and religion. You can find more information about us on our website, which is um, uh, listed here on the, the slide, www.chc.edu, that should be easy to remember, and then slash IRANS, uh, Institute for Religion and Science. We have lots of acronyms. We're going to have to settle on a, a, a one or two of them so we don't confuse you completely. If you're not already on our mailing list, so if you haven't received uh, a mailing from us, you should uh, sign up at the back because we will be having some you know, good lectures uh, next semester, uh, next, next year, and in the future. And so that would be one way that we can keep in touch with you. Although this is our last event for the spring at Chestnut Hill College, we will be repeating two of our lectures and maybe a third at other venues on Mo this coming Monday, uh, the 16th of April, uh, Peter Dodson will be repeating his lecture. So if you have friends or if you haven't uh, is, it been there, uh, you might want to come out to Cabrini College where we're going to have a repeat of uh, Peter's wonderful lecture entitled Faith in Fossils. And on May 10th, this lecture by Ed Devinney will be repeated at um, Pendle Hill, a Quaker retreat center in Wallingford, Pennsylvania. So we're trying to spread out over the, the uh, greater Philadelphia area and uh, connect with peoples of different faiths, faith traditions, and, uh, uh, and also include people from different kinds of science. The Institute is also sponsoring a reading circle. We'll begin on April 19th with a couple chapters by, you know, reading ahead of time, a couple chapters from John Haught's Making Sense of Evolution. If you're interested in joining us, just let me know after uh, the lecture, and I can give you the details. And of course, there will be much, much more coming next year, and so you want to be sure to be on our mailing list. This evening, we are honored to have as our speaker astronomer Dr. Ed Devinney, a longtime friend and a longtime participant in the dialogue between science and religion. Ed, who is presently serving as visiting professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Villanova University, is widely known for the Wilson Devinney computer code for binary star light curve analysis used by scores of astronomers. Ed is well qualified to speak to us tonight regarding the dialogue between astronomy and religion. He holds a bachelor's degree in physics from LaSalle University with a minor in both philosophy and religion and a doctorate in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Pennsylvania. He continues to be deeply interested in the philosophy of science, especially in the implications of current findings in cosmology. It has had an interesting and varied career. 
After receiving his doctorate, he spent 10 years working in the Florida University system, including two years as a National Academy of Sciences senior postdoctoral fellow at NASA Goddard Space Center. He then joined Siemens U.S. Research Labs and served as head of the Artificial Intelligence Department and chief scientist. From there, he spun out his own high technology company and served seven years as its CEO. Now he has returned to teaching and astronomical research. His interests include instrumentation, observational aspects of solar eclipses, and binary stars, including black hole binaries. Last semester, we were lucky enough to have him agree to teach an astronomy course at Chestnut Hill College. Maybe that will happen again. This evening, Ed will consider the topic, how does one see God? Um, incorporating the latest developments in cosmology, the science of, universes, uh, of the universe's origin and evolution, Ed will tell us whether he, if, um, tell us, will finally answer the question posed to him early in his career when someone asked him at a cocktail party, can you see God through the telescope? We look forward to your approach to this question, Ed. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Well, thank you very much for turning out this evening. It's nice to see you all. It's a nice crowd. Um, so I should tell you a little bit about myself that Kathy didn't mention. Uh, I have to, to tell you, like Peter did, that uh, I am a practicing Catholic, so you know, you'll know you know where I'm coming from on the religion side. Um, so Kathy told you a good bit about me, so I don't have to have to talk about myself up here. So let me, let me just get started. Uh, let me say also that if you have questions during the talk, if you can get my attention, feel free to ask. And at the end, I, I feel sure we'll have some time for, for discussion. That might work best. Okay. Um, so tonight my talk is going to be called... Uh, Heaven and the heavens. So I'm going to talk about the way heaven is, is regarded, both from a religious and a scientific point of view, and discuss a little bit about some of the issues that, that where there's some, some uh, how would I say, uh, stress between the religious side and, uh, and the scientific side. Okay, so we don't need to know that. Uh, but before we get, actually get to the topic at hand, uh, if you were here uh, almost, it was maybe a week ago or so, a little longer ago, and Peter gave a really wonderful talk. Um, and, and I thought that uh, I, I had to actually um, sort of come along and, and do something in, in, the, in the spirit of, of Peter's talk. I think that, that B should be a D, sorry about that. Uh, the World Trekker Competition, because Peter was talking about his paleontological work, which took him to places all over the world. So just a few moments to talk about that and so that that uh, I can sort of you know so this is solar eclipse chasing around the world here's an image of the sun at solar eclipse we can see with the moon blocking the sun you can even see the rough edges around the moon here and you can see the rays from the solar corona spreading out into into space the only time we can see this naturally from the earth is during the time of a total solar eclipse so when I was a graduate student um, I was uh, working out here in Malvern at the telescope getting data for my thesis, but I had the opportunity to take part in a couple of eclipse expeditions. So I want to talk about those very briefly. Uh, first was to go to uh, the South Pacific, uh, to Manoe Cook Islands for the 30 June 1965 solar eclipse. Here you see the Cook Islands outlined, and then there's a picture of Manoe, which is this one by three copra plantation where our site was. And in a solar eclipse, you have to be in a certain part of the world where the narrow uh, shadow of the, of the moon, uh, which completely blocks the sun, passes over. This is usually only a mile wide or so. So this is one of the, the bits of land in the, in the path that we could go to. And here's the, here's the site, and it would be a site. Uh, as you notice, things are sort of all over the place. But there were very few women, so we didn't have to keep things too, too, too neat. <laughs> And uh, we didn't do that. Um, and, and here's myself. Um, 
but hard at work. And as a sister, I was preparing my body for skin cancer. Uh, this was just around the time we, when, when um, uh, the, the skin doctors and dermatologists were finding out that sunlight was not really good for you. So I was practicing. So what, what I was doing was we had this big equipment and what we were trying to do was we were trying to measure how much light came through this little red slot as the moon moved up, this gray thing here symbolizing the moon moved up and covered up the sun. So we could, just, could figure out what was the, the, the drop off in, dark, in, in brightness of the sun towards its edge. You'll see in this picture, it's a little darker at the edge. It's a phenomenon which is known as? Limb darkening. Limb darkening, thank you very much. <laughs> That's why I asked Scott to come along. Well, it turns out that there was a beautiful first day cover stamp for this eclipse, but the weather on the stamp was a lot better than the weather that we had, which was like this, so we got no data. So that was 1965. So there, still, there were cultural benefits. I got to travel to New Zealand uh, to meet international colleagues on Manawai, including Russians, and this was the peak of the Cold War. Uh, they brought their commissar with them. They brought a little alcohol. So we had lots of political discussions that were very interesting. I had a chance to return home on this sailing vessel called the Goodwill with a stopover at Tahiti. Well, that was almost, almost paid for. And also, I made uh, new friends. Here's myself in the middle here, 1965 in June. A couple of people with me on the right is the solar astronomer Keith Pierce. And on the left is this guy. This guy is Jan Hall. And Jan came with us and he, he, was, he was working for me essentially, okay? Um, and he did pretty well. <laughs> he, he managed to do pretty well. He did better than I did, I think. But not much better. Um, so in, if, you, if you can't do it the first time, you go back and try again. So this was uh, October 1966, and you might be able to figure out where I had to go for this next eclipse. You might recognize the sugar loaf. We're standing at sugar loaf, and there's one of the original sugar loaves. Here's another picture of it here. This, this eclipse was visible at the point marked X at the bottom of this slide at a little town called Bajé in southern Brazil, and I got to stay in Brazil for about six weeks, and uh, it was an extremely exciting uh, trip. Um, in this case, this time, the airlines lost my equipment. And so, cultural benefits again. Learned some Portuguese, uh, joined the French at their site to have dinner with wine, of course. That's the way they travel. Um, scored a goal for the U.S. and the U.S. Brazil or, or in the U.S. Brazil soccer game. Playing for Brazil, drove a Volkswagen made in Sao Paulo, visited the new Brasilia, and saw all these new Niemeyer architected buildings. So, so let me go to, to the topic at hand then. Uh, but I had to do that, Peter. Hope you don't mind. Okay, heaven and the heavens. So, when I say heaven, what are we talking about? Sky in traditional mythological accounts, God's domain, goal of religious believers, proxy for religion, heaven. The heavens being the physical universe, and maybe we could use it as also a proxy for science. So as, uh, as Kathy Duffy said, that uh, after I got my degree at Penn and I took up my, my professorial duties at the University of South Florida, I often found in social situations, people would be asking me this question. When you look at far out into the sky in, in your telescope, can you see God? I was not really prepared for this. Um, I never thought about that. Never occurred to me. So uh, maybe we ought to look. Let's, let's check. Let's start with the solar system. Recognize this body, the red planet, Mars this beautiful exposure from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, we've seen a lot of Mars, but I don't think we've seen any, I don't think we've noticed that God is there. Here's a picture of Jupiter taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Further planet out, the giant planet of our solar system, a gaseous planet, all kinds of interesting features on it, but maybe nothing we recognize as, as God. I've got to show you this, I've got to show you this movie though. This is this is really nice. Let's see if I can do this. Here we are. 
This movie was put together by an amateur astronomer. He was observing from England of all places. Now the picture that's on the right here that you still see is taken by the Hubble Space, Tele uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. This is an amateur astronomer with a 14-inch telescope doing this. It's just astounding. So get out there and start looking at the sky. All right. Okay, let's go back to our, our talk here. So we don't see, we don't see God necessarily in, in, in Jupiter popping out at us. Let's look further afield. Let's look into the Milky Way, you know, our galaxy. And let's look at some of the locales where new stars are being made. Here's a, first of all, a picture of a schematic view of the galaxy that we live in. And the little dot that's sitting up in here, uh, there's the center down here. We're way up here. That's some, some good distance of something like 24,000 light years from the center. And that's, that's where we live. And this, this pinwheel spirals, spirals around in about 250,000 years. So we live out in the suburbs. Uh, now, we don't actually get this view, because to get this view, we'd have to travel immense distances in space and look, look back. I'll show you eventually the view that we do get. It's the view, basically, that we get in, in the night sky when we say, ha, there's the Milky Way. I see the Milky Way. Here's a, a constellation you may be familiar with, the constellation of Orion. And this is a region of star birth. We see uh, some of these two bright supergiant stars up here. Uh, one, one of which may become a supernova at some time in the near future. And we notice, here's the belt of Orion. These are Orion's shoulders, and these are his knees down here. And this is his sword right here. Uh, and this little fuzzy thing, let's take a look at that, zoom in on that. That's called the Orion Nebula. And here's a zoom up of the Orion Nebula from the Hubble Space Telescope. And what the Orion Nebula is, it's, it's an area of star birth. And we know that the Orion Nebula is a very young place uh, because we know that stars are still being made there. As a matter of fact, um, it's not so easy to see in this particular exposure, but there are, there are four stars that form what we call a trapezium, something like a distorted uh, rectangle. And these four stars in the Orion Nebula they, that configuration cannot be older than some, say, 50,000 years because such configurations of four objects are not gravitationally stable. So they won't stay around for a long period of time. And we know from other, other reasons because we can actually see uh, young stars in their birth cocoons being made as this interstellar gas and dust collapses to form stars. Here's another area where we have uh, star formation taking place in the constellation of Crookes and Carina, and these fuzzy areas, these fuzzy red areas are always clues that this is where stars are being made. You're seeing the glow of hydrogen gas that's being set to glowing, just like neon signs. But in this case, it's the ultraviolet light of very hot young stars that's setting this gas into glowing. So whenever we see these red regions, we think young star forming regions. Here's another beautiful close-up of the Carina Nebula in this same area, which resembles in many ways what we just saw in the, in the, in the, um, in the Orion Nebula. This is also an area where stars are being made. To see the Carina Nebula, though, you need to go to the Southern Hemisphere. So you should take a trip, do a star trip to the Southern Hemisphere and take a look at these beautiful Southern objects. So, Besides these star birth areas, we can look at some substar death areas. Here's, um, here's a, an image of a star like the sun in its death throes. The particular colorations of the image are not too important. They're kind of artificially done for, for various technical reasons. But the actual uh, picture is an accurate picture. It's a photograph, an image. And at the center of this image is a dying star. And it's thrown off these shells of gases that you can see illuminated by the star that remains. And there's also some peculiar reason, which I don't know offhand, why we have these searchlight type things showing up out here. But this is a, this is a dying star region. You would call such a thing a planetary nebula. Here's an example of the death of a massive star. In this case, it would be a star that may be 10 times the mass of our sun. 
They don't live very long, even though they're a star would, be, would have 10 times the mass of the sun. Its lifetime is very short because more massive stars are hotter in their interiors. And if you remember how chemical reactions go, you know that heat makes chemical reactions go. So the more massive stars being hotter in their centers, they basically use up their nuclear fuel in a very short period of time. Very massive stars can live as, as few as two million years or so. Whereas the sun, which is now five billion years old, can continue on for another five billion years because it's not being profligate in its use of its fuel. But when these, when these massive stars do decide to end their lives, they do so in a very dramatic fashion. Here's an example called the Crab Nebula, um, which, is, um, which is the, the remains of a star that blew off most of its, most of its mass. Um, there are a couple of little blue dots in the, near the middle of this picture, one of which is the remains of the star that, uh, that blew up. It's a little core that's no bigger than the size of Manhattan. And it's spinning at about 30 times a second. Um, it's just a, just a matter of fate that it isn't spinning a little bit slower. As it gets older, it will slow down, like we all do. Uh, but I keep thinking of this astronomer, Walter Bade, who spent a lot of time studying the Crab Nebula. And he identified this central star as a very peculiar star, a peculiar spectrum. And if something blinks on and off 30 times a second, like your TV screen does. You don't see any blinking. But if, if Walter Bada had looked at the Crab Nebula, say, 25,000 or 35,000 years from now, and it had slowed down to blinking twice a second or half or every, once every two seconds, he would have probably fallen off the, off, off the ladder that he was using to look into the eyepiece. I mean, can you imagine? You go up to the, to the eyepiece and there's a star blinking at you? It would be unheard of. But this one blinks 30 times a second, Crab Nebula. It does look like it says splat, doesn't it? You can, you can almost hear that one. Here's another example of a star ending its lifetime. This is a star that blew up in the uh, 1987, is when we got the light from it. It's from um, something called the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite galaxy to our own Milky Way. It's about 150,000 light years away from from us. Uh, the, the red rings there are not artifacts. The, the star has actually created those rings by blowing off some gases in a uh, kind of a conical shape. Of course, we, when we saw this event occur in 1987, the actual event in time occurred about 150,000 years before because it took like that much time to get to us from the large Magellanic Cloud. So these are examples of a star deaths. These are all beautiful things. But we look out there through this telescope, and we can ask ourselves, what are we seeing? And do we see, do we see God? Here's another example. This is another supernova event taken with a Hubble telescope. So this is actually the panoramic view that we get of the Milky Way if we had really super sensitive, sensitive eyes. And we could see all around the sky. Um, this part in the center is, is where the middle of the pinwheel is. Um, all this dark stuff is dust and gas that obscures the view of these, of these hundreds of billions of stars that, that are strewn throughout the arms of the Milky Way and also th around the nucleus and bulge of the Milky Way as an object. There are hundreds of... There, there are tens of billions of stars in this region. And if it weren't for this gas and dust, we'd be able to, we'd be able to, to see an awful lot of light. The galaxy would be a lot brighter. And then there are these two little guys that I'll, that I'll circle here. These are these Magellanic clouds. So these objects are doing some sort of little orbital bit about our galaxy, like the moon is orbiting our, our Earth. And um, apparently, they, we don't know whether they've gone through the, through the Milky Way once before or more times. height. And they're called the Magellanic Clouds because when Magellan first sailed around the world, he went into the southern hemisphere, he saw these little fuzzy things and the name stuck. 
Well, let's look a little further afield since we haven't found, uh, found God yet. Well, we might have, but we don't, maybe we don't know it. Here's a nearby spiral galaxy. And this one, we see the spiral arms outlined by these beautiful red uh, regions, regions of uh, glowing hydrogen gas, regions where stars are being formed. Stars are always formed in the, in the spiral arms of these, of these galaxies. And I think even if we don't know the astrophysics of what's going on here, certainly these are beautiful objects to look at and uh, they just, just attract our eyes. Here's a panoramic picture of a nearby spiral, the nearest spiral to us, the Andromeda galaxy. It's the only galaxy, besides the Magellanic Clouds, I guess, that we can actually see with the naked eye. In the northern sky on a very dark, dark uh, site, in the wintertime you can see a sort of a fuzz and this fuzz stretches across the sky about 12 times the diameter of the moon. But it's all very faint. So you only see a little smudgy part in the center, which is that nucleus of that, that yellow nucleus that you see here. But when you take a long time exposure like this, you recognize it as being a spiral galaxy. And it's fairly close to being a twin of our own galaxy. Maybe that's what we would look like if you were on a planet around the star in Andromeda. And also, Andromeda has these two guys here, this one here and this one here, that are also satellites of it. So just like we have satellites, it has satellites as well. It's about two and a half million light years away. So we're not going to get there in a hurry. Here's another example uh, of, this is called a barred spiral. And you can see why, because in the center it has this sort of straightish bar type thing and, these, and then the spiral arms sort of spring out from the ends of the bars. We still don't exactly know why galaxies have bar-like structures. But again, you can see these, these bright, bright uh, bluish arms. These bright bluish arms are places where stars are being created. New stars. Okay. This is a, this is a very interesting object. This is visible in the southern hemisphere. It's called Centaurus A. And what it is, it was recognized maybe about 35 years ago as being, a, a, what you're seeing here is a collision of two, two galaxies, one of which is kind of spherical and has this sort of uh, uh, background whitish stuff. And then there's another galaxy that you see, like a spiral galaxy on edge that is cutting through and colliding with this background one. And this is a very interesting object because it's a big, it's a bright radio source, it makes a lot of radio noise. Um, it also has a very, a very interesting jet in the center. And it has a black hole at its center as well. Actually, it has a pretty massive black hole at its center. The Milky Way, we have found out in the last 20 years, also has a black hole at its center. And it seems like most galaxies have black holes of some sort or other probably has something to, to do with the way galaxies form. We would like to know exactly which comes first, the black hole or the galaxy. We, we don't know that yet. Here's a sort of long, uh, a, a, wide, a wide view of Centaurus A, combining a lot of information uh, from radio, which is this, um, um, this blue stuff in here, and uh, X-rays, which is this jet thing here that's comes all the way from the center of this galaxy all the way into the suburbs. And this jet is undoubtedly associated with something going on with the central black hole of Centaurus A. Exactly how that happens, we don't know. Um, I'd like to find that out too. Um, here are some other examples of colliding galaxies that we can see. Now it turns out that stars are very far apart from each other. <clears throat> if the sun were a basketball right here, the nearest star would be, would be a basketball about the size uh, in California somewhere. So if galaxies collide with each other, it's mostly an empty space. They don't hit each other. But they can, cause, they can cause their shapes to change by gravitational forces. And this is an example. Here's another example, a really beautiful sight. Okay, and here's a whole cluster of galaxies. Galaxies tend to occur in clusters. And in fact, clusters probably occur in clusters too. 
So this is called the Abel cluster. It's a very rich cluster of galaxies. And if you'll notice in this picture, you see these little arcs here, like here? And see these little arcs, shapes here? These arcs seem to be centered around, say around in here, in the center of that, that cluster of galaxies. Those arcs are images of distant galaxies that are being imaged by the gravitational lens formed by this cluster of galaxies. And this, it's like this is a bad lens and is distorting the images of the galaxies in the back. So let's take one picture, let's take one look at the outer limits of creation and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, our topic and specifics. Um, so here we are looking out the Hubble ultra deep field. This is staggeringly distant, probably of the order of uh, 10,000 light years away, a billion light year, 10 billion light years away. We're looking close to the beginning of time here. And if we look here, if we were going to maybe see God, we might expect to see God here. So the question is, is heaven out there? It would appear from what we've seen that heaven is not so easily found. On the other hand, what should we have been looking for? It's not going to be easy. Maybe math offers a hint about heaven and the heavens. But notice it's kind of bad math. Heaven can't equal the heavens. That's bad math. So probably we have to distinguish these things. So um, why are we looking for God up there anyway? And what I could say to you is, well, it's all history's fault. Let's look at that. Well, from ancient times, what do people think about the sky? It's, it's an ideal place. It's, re, it's a revered and maybe feared domain. There was night, cold and black, mysterious movements of the moon, the wandering stars, the planets. It would be scary. And, but at the same time, these sky, sky things were markers and harbingers of the seasons. So it was inevitably linked to the lives that people led. So we would have this link to agriculture, for example. Then we'd have eclipses, which would be special threatening events. The sun would go away, good heavens. Uh, the planets, we would notice, would have, have observable cycles. Venus, for example, is easy to see. It's now in the western sky setting. It's an evening star. In a couple more months, it'll pop up before the sun rises. In the east, it'll be a morning star. So it's sort of understandable that the sky would naturally become heaven. Here we look at uh, the Egyptian god Nut, the goddess of the sky, and here is Nut spreading over all of her domain and protecting it from, from chaos um, and, and afforded uh, the protection of the dead when they entered the afterlife, separated chaos from the ordered cosmos in the world. And then according to the Egyptians, uh, during the day the sun and the moon, if visible, would make their way across her body at dusk, they would be swallowed, passed through her belly during the night, and be reborn at dawn. Well, here we have Stonehenge. What does this tell us? It's a paradigm for alignment monuments. And it's now understood that Stonehenge did have a lot to do with the spiritual life of the people that lived then. And in fact, that seems to be a character of most of these, uh, most of these uh, monuments. Here's kind of a natural monument. This is a sort of a sighting, a sighting mountain where this mountaintop here, uh, if you stand over here and you put yourself in specific, a specific position, uh, various things would show up for you, like where the summer solstice would occur, uh, where the w winter moon would have a standstill. Uh, so all of these features of the, sun, of the sun and moon's motion would be marked out on the, on the edge of this, the peaks of features of this mountain, so this would become a sacred space. Here's Newgrange in Ireland, built about 5,000 years ago, which marks um, one of the sun's standstills. And if you, go, if you go down through the entrance where you see these people are down through a long, long entrance, there's a room and sort of in the very middle where the sunlight will come in on a specific day and illuminate that interior room. So look at the effort that people put into this. Right? They must have thought the sky was very important. Here in uh, the New World, we have uh, 
the Mayans and their observatories, like this observatory at Chichen Itza, which was to take uh, observations of Venus, for example, um, and note its position in the sky, and consider the auguries of the position of Venus, and whether it was time to throw people down these, down the, off the cliffs and things like that, sacri make, make sacrifice. So anyway, so we have the sky, and it would acquire this kind of reverential sort of aspect. Now, if we look back into the ancient Greeks, by that time, there were sort of two views of the sky. If we look at Plato, Plato would say, look to the perfection of the heavens for truth. Still, the heavens are still very special, right? Aristotle would just say, look around you at what is if you would know the truth. Less reverential. So here you could sort of see the, the, the divergence between um, a reverential view, a, a religious view of the sky, and maybe the hints of maybe an analytical or future scientific view of the sky. So, in fact, at the time of the ancient Greeks, there were some that thought that the sky being equal to heaven, like the heaven of religion, was a kind of a presumption. Um, in ancient Greek times, the sky could be considered without thinking about the gods. And maybe the first person that I'd like to mention about this is Aristarchus of Samos, who actually put forth the first heliocentric theory. Um, he clearly did, and in the writings of, uh, uh, of Archimedes, uh, Archimedes writes to the king about what Aristarchus said about the sky. And it's clear that Aristarchus was thinking about this heliocentric theory. Not only that, but he claimed that the stars were very, very far away compared to the distance between the earth and the sun. He was accused of impiety. But he didn't. But the, with the rise of scientific knowledge, the traditional picture of the sky as being uh, a, a religious site or only was stressed. So we went from the question of who governs the sky to the question of, well, what governs the sky? That's sort of the transition that took place over some, some period of time. And how did it do this divergence? You could say maybe it started with Copernicus and Galileo. Uh, Copernicus with the heliocentric theory, Galileo with his telescope observing the sky and reporting what he saw. Um, I found this somewhere. I thought it was pretty nice. <laughs> Not my view. So when Galileo uh, used the telescope for the first time to study the heavens, he found, well, there are mountains and valleys on the moon, sunspots on the sun. These are blemishes blemishes of this very holy, sacred object in the heavens. Uh, Jupiter's four largest moons he found orbiting Jupiter, so that, why couldn't the Earth orbit the Sun? Evidence for the heliocentric theory. So of course he had to publish all this stuff, and I say here he unwisely trumpeted this new knowledge. When he talked about this, this dialogue of the, of the two chief world systems, he went a little overboard, and uh, that got him into trouble with the church. So he was under house arrest for life, and he was told he had to re renounce the heliocentric theory, which he maybe mumbled about under his breath. So um, I want to point out that cardinals should not do physics. This is the 1615 AD version. Uh, it says, to assert that the earth revolves around the sun is as erroneous as to claim that Jesus was not born of a virgin. This was, this was uttered by Cardinal Bellarmine during the trial of Galileo in 1615. So hopefully uh, the conclusion of Cardinal Bellarmine is not, in, is not changed if the Earth, in fact, does revolve around the sun. I'll come back to that. So what did Galileo think? Galileo thought that um, the intention of the Holy Spirit is to teach us how one goes to heaven, not how the heavens go. And he went on to talk about what the Bible means and so on. This will, this will come back. So then there's the time of uh, the Enlightenment. We have people like uh, Pierre Simon, the Marquis de Laplace, and he's uh, talking to Napoleon. Napoleon asked him, why didn't you mention God in your book on astronomy? And he says, je n'avais pas besoin de cette hypothèse là. Uh, I didn't have any need for that hypothesis. That is, that I didn't need to put God into the science because it wasn't necessary.
Okay, so that was sort of heaven and the heavens then. What about now? Um, that was long ago if we learned anything. Uh, no. Well, we've learned, maybe we've learned something. But there's still this continued salvo of science, religion, fireworks from polar opposite views. The first one, science can't be correct because it is inconsistent with the Bible. The second one, religion can't be right because it's refuted by scientific discoveries. Well, let's have a look at that. Science can't be correct because it's inconsistent with the Bible. So if you're thinking along those lines, what you decide is, well, we should invent creation science and teach in schools as an alternative, a science that would be consistent with the Bible. So what bothers such people? Well, anything that's old, older than 6,000 years, because the Bible is interpreted by these folks to have a timeline, and the timeline is supposed to be about 6,000 years. And anything that's 6,000, and anything that's, that's farther away than 6,000 light years, that, that wouldn't be good, because that object would have to be older than 6,000 years in order to allow the light to get to us from it. So anything that involves change, like evolution in biology and elsewhere, even in stellar evolution and cosmology, is troublesome. It's troublesome. So who's, where do we see evidence of this sort of uh, project that's dealing with science? We can look at these examples. Uh, you find them on the web. The Institute for Creation Research, which is biblical, accurate, and certain. That's, that's pretty good. Certainty is good. And I think certainty is all part of this. And there's another one called AnswersInGenesis.org. And finally, GalileoWasWrong.com. And I, as I say, I'm not kidding. And moreover, this last one is, is, is run by a bunch of Catholics. Terrible. Terrible. So embarrassing. So the answer is to, to fixing up science is we need biblical science. And we can use the Bible as our science textbook. We could show, for example, that physics is already in there. Okay. Well, this would be something called post-diction, or God said it first. Post-diction versus prediction. So what does science do? Science predicts. You make hypotheses, you make observations, you try to predict what that would mean for the next thing, and then you go and look for that next thing, maybe in the sky or in the laboratory, and then you keep building. Post-diction just says, well, uh, as it says here, you show that some important physics phenomenon is already described in the Bible, as it's used here. So post-diction is important to bolster the, bolster the inerrancy claims of the Bible, even regarding matters of science. But post-diction isn't science. Nothing is proved. If you say, well, let me give you an example. Here's the Institute for Creation Research. And I've, here we have, I've, I've sort of made this uh, darkened here. So the Bible is a textbook of science. I bet you didn't, didn't know that. And the justification is sort of the second quote here. Um, if I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Well, what do you mean by heavenly? Earthly, heavenly. Do you mean earthly Human beings, heavenly, the spirits. That doesn't necessarily mean heavenly, the heavens, or the sky, or stars. So it goes on to talk about um, the problem of, of scientific errors claimed to be in scripture and how this is a problem. And um, uh, Dr. Morris goes on to say, well, it's obvious, of course, the Bible isn't a scientific textbook in the sense of giving detailed technical descriptions and mathematical formulations of natural phenomena. Uh, you probably have already noticed that. Uh, but he says, this is not an adequate reason for questioning the objective accuracy of these numerous portions of scripture which do deal with natural phenomena and historical events. Um, and then he goes on to say, well, if the Bible would be wrong about a scientific thing, then it couldn't be completely inerrant. It would be an error. And maybe it's an error about faith matters. And that is what motivates these people. To some extent, I have to say, I feel for them to be stuck in this kind of position. It's kind of too bad. So, so going on, um, 
Uh, Dr. Morris talks about conservation of energy. Well, that's already in the Bible. Um, and he starts by saying in the first paragraph here, if, if anybody paid attention to the Bible, they would know that the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy, was already there. They would have discovered it much earlier. And the second paragraph says, the conservation principle is strongly emphasized, conservation of energy principle, in the summary statement at the end of creation when the Bible says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his works, which he made. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because, that, because in that he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Amen. I have to say, maybe, I'm, maybe it's just me, but I don't see conservation of energy in this statement. And he goes on to say, nothing is now being created, and this is what was finally formalized by science in the first law of thermodynamics. So this is really post-diction. What this basically says is, look, I'm looking around for things that I'm reading about in the Bible, and I say, oh, I find this thing here, and it's, it's sort of like what's described over here. So, so this physics thing here must be what this paragraph here is talking about. And what do you get out of that? You can't do any science with that. A post-diction doesn't lead you to anything. It's not a scientific kind of um, um, endeavor. So here's answers in Genesis, a little bit from that. And the question is, and I've, I've sort of got it down here, can creationists be scientists? What do you think about that? There's an answer for that. And the answer is, right from their site, clearly creationists can indeed be real scientists. And this shouldn't be surprising, since the very basis for scientific research is biblical creation. Circular argument. Okay, so Galileo was wrong. Uh, I won't say much about this, but these guys are sort of really serious. And one of the guys that's running this uh, organization is called Robert Sungenis, PhD. PhD. He holds a, advanced degrees in theology and religious studies from George Washington University, Westminster Theological Seminary. And his PhD is from Columbus International University. Which, which is uh, situated in uh, Vanuatu. So I'm sure it's quite a fine institution. Um, so how, do you, how could you fight godless science? Here's another little exercise. Well, you could suggest alternate explanations for theories that appear to conflict with the Bible. This is not post-diction now. This is advanced pseudoscience. So what you can do is you point to issues in accepted scientific explanations for a phenomenon. And you, what you usually do is you kind of exaggerate the, that the problem, that there's a problem, you make some exaggerations, or you even fib, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, then you suggest new physics that will solve this problem. Maybe the speed of light was different in the past, the rate of radioactive decay was different in the past, and you just completely ignore what such a change would mean to the rest of physics. But what you can do by this is, for example, here, here's a way of trying to keep the universe young. Um, let's talk about cosmological distances. They're a problem because they imply light travel times, which would be objects which would be much older than the biblical age of everything. So anything beyond 6,000 light years away is a problem. So you have to kind of manage the distance determination to stars that tells us how far away things are. So um, according to this guy, Jason Lyle, who is a PhD, is a genuine astronomical PhD, he's going to burn for this. <laughs> um, his claim is that distances beyond those that can be determined by direct measurement, which I'll tell you what that means. It means like what surveyors do here on Earth. About 200 light years away is as far as direct measurement can take us. And beyond that, all distance estimates are very suspect, so we can't have any confidence in those distances. But he's kind of fibbing. So what I've got here is a, is a chart, and what it shows is, it shows the Earth at the left and objects of various distance away in this, in this uh, picture going to the right. Now, for 
for planets that go around the sun in the first section on the left, we can bounce radar waves off Venus and we can, as an example, we can tell the direct distance to Venus by the transit time of the radar wave. Now when you get outside the solar system, things are a little bit more difficult. And this red ellipse here talks about the nearby stars, distances out to the order of 100 light years. And how do we find those distances? Well, we use triangulation, like you do with surveyors. And what we need, when you do triangulation, you need to see something from two points of view. So if I want to know the distance, say, to somebody in the back of the room, I could start from here. And I see where they are located with respect to the back of the room. Then I move over here, and I see that, th that the person shifts with respect to the background of the room. If I'm clever, I can figure out, if I know how far I moved here, I can figure out how far away that person is in the back of the room. And that's a method which we call parallax. But that's all it means, just do that. Well, what do we use as our baseline? My shifting back and forth. We use the orbit of the Earth. We take pictures of a nearby star, that's shown here. Here's a nearby star that's seen from this position of the Earth's orbit. You see it against these background stars here. And then this one, when you get six months later when the Earth is over here, you see the star now shifted over to this position. And you can use that information to tell how far away that star is. That goes out to a couple hundred light years. But, but as you see on the right of this uh, ellipse, there's various other sections. There's the Milky Way at 10 to the 5 light years that's up, up here. Nearby galaxies, 10, 10 million light years. Clusters of galaxies, 10 billion light years. How do we find these distances? Well, we use a number of tricks. One is we find objects that are, in, that are out there in other galaxies that we know are present in our galaxy. And how faint they are tells us how far away that other galaxy must be. But there, there are tons of these methods. We don't have time to go into them. So, so what Dr. Lyle is saying is you've got to stop here. So all these other methods that have been used for the past you know, 35, 40 years, they're nonsense. They don't work. You don't count those. But there are literally hundreds of pounds of astronomy journals on these topics. I mean, a vast amount of information. And it ticks and ties. But then this must be wrong, too. No, there's no, no distances out to these, the Hubble Deep Field. It's not at 10 billion light years away. It's a trick. So these ideas of, of limiting your distance to direct measurements doesn't make sense anyway, because like we're familiar with estimating distances. Take a car with headlights. If you see the headlights at being away from you, cars some distance away, you can judge the distance of the car maybe by the faintness of the headlights. Or you, can, you, could, you could see a ship sailing away and judge how faint, it, faint it, how far it is by how small it appears. And, uh, and so on. So there's an infinite number of ways of doing this. But uh, what Dr. Lyle hasn't bothered to research is that in the past two years, radio astronomers have been able to use this parallax method, this direct method, to measure distances out to 24 million light years. So that means these objects are literally 24 million light years away. It took like 24 million years for that light to get here. So, so if, if that's the case and you don't believe that, then what's wrong? Is geometry wrong? You don't believe in geometry or trigonometry? So anyway, that's what we have from direct measurement. But you could object, as he would probably do. He said, well, the speed of light isn't necessarily constant, and it depends on that, and, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So you keep making these extra hypotheses to kind of save the, save the situation. But what I want to tell you is that physics isn't a game of arbitrariness. It is a structure, but of what sort? Is it a structure like a public library? So all the theories are in the public library, and you don't like one of the theories, so you go in to the library and you slip out the theory that you don't like, and you have your other one here, here, and you slip that theory in, and there we are, we're done. But that isn't what physics is like. It's it's more like, like this. It's like an interconnected structure. It's not just a, it's not a collection of facts. It's a collection of interconnected theories. 
and they all depend on each other. And if you go and say, well, I want to take this piece of the theory out, well, what are you going to substitute in there? And is it going to have the same relationship to all the other theories? And what's the implication for the rest of the theories? So you can't quite do that. Let's speak briefly about, let me watch my time here. Let's speak briefly about religion being untenable. The other point. It's untenable because science refutes its beliefs. So we should use frontier science as the best evidence for the wrongness of religion. And I go on to invent this new word, Unrechtigkeit. It's a German word I invented so we can make, make this sound very impressive. So um, we could take any kind of, uh, uh, say, publication that's, that talks about this, this phenomenon. And a good one is something that just came out recently by Lawrence Krauss, which is called A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Something Rather Than Nothing. There's a very interesting review of this book in the New York Times book review section about three weeks ago. And you can, if you go to the New York Times uh, site, you can, you can search it. But he gives a very fascinating account of current thinking about the universe's beginning. And I'm not, certainly not arguing with those, a lot of those ideas. Uh, as, as seen now through the prism of string theory and the ideas from quantum mechanics, which is a very peculiar physics, but one that seems to be tested and is found to be correct. And we use the results of quantum mechanics all the time in our electronics devices, for example. So he gives this account, but I want to point out here the, the, the afterword by Richard Dawkins, which you see at the lower left. I don't know whether you know too much about Dawkins, but Dawkins is very much against religion. And he's, um, he, he's, he's a kind of a militant guy in that regard. He's a, a, a biologist. So Krauss's point about the universe is that quantum mechanics allows the universe to come into existence from nothing. That doesn't necessarily tell you a lot, but at least quantum mechanics allows that. It's not forbidden. So Dawkins takes this point, and he takes that, and he says, well, in that case, we don't have a need for God to create the universe. But we all learned in philosophy about first causes. That you haven't taken God away. God is just the first cause of the universe coming into existence from nothing. Nothing, nothing has changed. So my score for, for this book is physics one, philosophy zero. Here's Cardinals Should Not Do Physics, the 2005 version. Um, the multiverse idea is something that's being very much discussed now, and it's really a quite interesting thing in its physical sense. So, um, but Cardinal Schoenborn here writes to the New York Times in 2005. He doesn't like the idea because he says that, that basically neo-Darwinism, Darwinism, and the multiverse hypothesis, that is there's more than one universe maybe, it's invented to avoid the overwhelming evidence for purpose and design found in modern science. Well, I think that somebody should be made to write 100 times, science does not do purpose. It's not the job of science to do that. So I would say also that Cardinal Schoenberg's very objection to science failure to deliver purpose is precisely the proper domain for religion. That's what religion is supposed to do. Tell us why we, why we should live our lives in a certain way and what life means. So just let me close by mentioning what do scientists, scientists really think about religion? The, there's this popular perception that godless scientists and godless science, and is it correct? It's a matter of, of, of fact, so let's find out. I'm going to use this landscape to try it out the players and the concepts briefly. Uh, I have science going in the vertical direction, religion in the horizontal direction. I, I'm going to publish this. I think this is very advanced. Um, but we could play with this a little bit. For example, um, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you like science, the chances are, in popular thought, you might be antagonistic to religion. If, you, if you're committed to religion, you might be antagonistic to science. So you, these, this is the popular idea. So here's Richard Dawkins, science expert antagonistic to religion. His book goes over there, The God Delusion. Um, now over here we have Francis Collins, The Language of God. 
a committed, a committed religious person and a science expert. He goes over there. Here's someone writing about whether Adam and Eve really existed. He's concerned because biology, uh, DNA stuff, tells us that, well, the, the human race originated in Africa 100,000 years ago from a relatively small group of people. And he thinks that these should be identified with Adam and Eve, and how does this all work? So we can put him in there. Kind of, he accepts the science idea, and he's very committed. He goes there. And here's, here's where Lawrence Krauss, I would put him, him himself, uh, as an expert in science, but, def, but unfriendly to religious ideas. He, he goes there. Now, getting back to this question of science and religion, what scientists really think, uh, Elaine, let me get her name again, Elaine Eklund has written a book on this, published by Oxford University Press, and here's what she says. She finds that 50% of scientists surveyed um, believe that there's no conflict, conflict between their religious belief and, and their, their, their so-called, well, their, their work in science. So returning to the question, when you look out in the sky in, the, in your telescope, can you see God? I think I would say, as you might expect, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's Psalm 19.1, Peter. Mm. But, but now wait a minute. Why is it important to find God in regions with characteristic length of 1.3 times 10 to the 26 meters, the size of the universe? Why, did, why is that important? What about the few tens of meters, like you guys out there? Or what about, what about this picture at the lower right? That's an image of the human brain. That is not a, that's not a drawing. That's a technical image of the human brain which shows nerve bundles in it. So that's pretty remarkable too. Why is it that we can only talk about, about discovering God in the big places, in the middle places, or in, why not the middle places and the small places as well? So finally, maybe we should rethink. When you think about anything, can you see God? I would say that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. I'm sure we all enjoyed uh, the beautiful pictures and the wonderful uh, words you had to share with us. We have some time for questions, so please raise your hand, and uh, Andrea will come around with the microphone. Please speak into the microphone so we can record. Scott, don't you have a question? I don't actually need the mic, Ed, but um, a lot of discussion comes up in the news and in this religion science debate using the word theory as a kind of a discrediting oh. idea. Yeah. Would you give us your thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, it comes up in, uh, all the time in uh, the theory of evolution. Well, we have theories too. We have quantum theory. You know about atomic bombs? Quantum theory works. Just because it's a theory doesn't mean it, it's not efficacious. And as you know, and that's probably a good, good, good question to ask anyway at a time like this, is that a theory means basically a, an explanation that covers a, a large body of facts and ties them all together. It gives you a coherent view of what's going on. Not exactly like the law of gravity, Although we also speak of Newton's theory of gravity, we speak of Einstein's theory of gravity as a kind of a, a, a perfection of Newton's law and applicable at high speeds and things like that. So a theory is not really something I just made up and I think, hmm, I think um, I, think I have a theory. It's, it ha it's a scientific concept that is not fully appreciated by the public and it causes a lot of problems. Um, I'm not sure I know what to do about it except in every venue where or we could explain what we mean by a theory to do so. I think your, your image of the, the building and the structure with the, the, the pillar sort of representing a theory that's built on another. Uh, and I, Thanks. I, I think that needs a lot more work 
there, one could very profitably develop that theme. Uh, I, I, think, I think there's a, a, a short book there that would be very, very helpful. Uh, I think one of your slides said uh, we should remind you to talk about the multiverse theory. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, what, what's your opinion of the multiverse theory? Um, well, that was ref re really referring to Cardinal Schoenborn's quote. Schoenborn's quote. C Cardinals should not do physics, unless they're scientists. Uh, actually, actually, I like the idea. It, it doesn't, it, faith-wise, it, I have no problems with it. Um, what I'm seeing is that I'm reading this paper by this guy called Rafael Buoso. Um, I don't really understand all of it thoroughly at all. But he's a guy out at, um, is he, he's on the West Coast, maybe you, I, somewhere on the West Coast. And he's talking about string theory, the multiverse, and dark matter. And I'm, I'm reading this paper thinking, this is really interesting. What's happening is that the multiverse idea is, is like, um, how would we call it? It's something to work with to develop new ideas. Whether, whether we in this universe will see any evidence of other, other bubble universes, which in, in the multiverse theory we are a bubble universe, is a matter of some debate. Um, there might be some way in which we can tell whether what we can see out to the limits of what we can see is all there is. Um, and the, I'll tell you why it comes up. Um, and it has some theological consequences, I would say, in the religious science debate anyway. Um, if, you, if you look at how this universe started, it, it expanded from a, from a small, hot, dense thing, smaller than a pinhead. And it was exceedingly well balanced, such that if the expansion had been a little bit faster, uh, no, no stars would have formed. If the expansion had been a little bit slower, it, this mass would have collapsed back on itself. It was the whole mass of the universe compressed into this little region. And it didn't expand. It's not that it expands into some other space. It's that it is space. Um, so, so this is a very particular universe. And without the right expansion to one part in like 50 decimal places, you don't get life. So you could say, well, looks like the universe was designed just for us. And uh, I think there are several responses to that. Some scientists might think, oh, come on. Does that mean God did it? Uh, or you could say, well, there probably were a lot of universes formed by some process. And there, there are theoretical ideas kicking around, um, not really any observations yet, about, you know, you could have multiple universes. So one of them would be just the one that you happen to live in. You wouldn't live in a universe that was unf unfriendly to life. It just couldn't happen. So it's, um, it's not sure what that was all telling, telling us. But what I could say is that um, I think that this idea is going to stick around. And, and I think it's going to have some absolutely remarkable consequences. Um, yes, I, uh, with regards to the uh, previous question, to the last one, um, well, when I when I ask um, when I ask my students, I'm a retired physics professor at Penn State. Um, I I generally ask what what students prefer to have the facts or the theory. They have choice of one only, and the majority, of course, prefer the facts. They fail to realize that the theory encompasses the fact, and it would not have become a theory had it not encompasses the fact. That's a good but it's that's got a very key point that yeah. physics has. Yeah. Physics, in fact, has replaced the prophets because of its predictive power. The theory has the predictive power, and that's what distinguishes them greatly. Right. That's my point with regards to that. And then I find you more daring, too, on the point of seeing. I think by, if I'm asked, where do, we find, where do we see God? 
my first question is to answer the question with another question. It depends what you mean by C. Because C, yeah. it's not an action of the eye, but the action of the brain. Yes. And as a result, I would go into detail as to, I can say I see what you're talking about, and yet it's nothing material. And uh, so I think I would have gone that way. <laughs> not that you have gone wrong, of course. You're more daring than I am. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Thank you very much. Um, I have an observation, a question, and a joke. I'll start with the observation. Uh, the observation is that the conclusion is really reminiscent of the last speaker, uh, Peter, a couple of weeks back. I copied uh, from him. I found that resonant. <laughs> That's marvelous. The, the question is, um, in terms of the conclusion, everything declares the glory of God and showeth his handiwork, uh, when we believe that, are we being a Platonist, an Aristotelian, both, or does it matter? And then the joke is, um, I was roughly in your generation, and I was there too in my shorts. I used coconut oil, and I wonder, did you? <laughs> no, I did use coconut oil, but it wouldn't have helped anyway. Uh, but... Um, Let's see, Aristotelian or Platonic? Mm. I, I, I'm going for Aristotle, maybe. Um, mathematics and physics are not very popular in American society. And um, it is my understanding that an average person can have his or her opinion pertaining to the, let's say, evolution just by what I did, visiting museum in Cincinnati, uh, and uh, you don't have to read them. But you, your imagination can tell you intuitively whether somebody is right or somebody yeah. is wrong, and you can have your own opinion. However, 99% of us are not familiar with contemporary mathematics, uh, cannot make... Um, difficult equation in their heads. So we rely on authorities, people with great names, famous authors. And my question to you is, what was your reaction and reaction of scientists like you when you noticed that in his last book, Stephen Hawking's, said that the concept of God is no longer necessary for him. Well, it's a personal matter, I think, for him. I'm, I'm not sure. And he's, I mean, he's a person of renown, so I think some people are going to think that's important. Um, I thought you were going to go a little bit more about um, authority and, and listening and, and, and how decisions are made uh, in, in a democracy. But who who does know who who is in command of the facts, and who's listening, and what are people's how are people's opinions formed? Um, it is a bit troublesome to um, to see people speaking without authority uh, on topics they don't really know anything about. Uh, and I guess you can have an opinion, but it is not an informed opinion. There's an awful lot of that. I worry about that, but. It's part of the part of the problem of living in a democracy, that, um, as a friend of mine will often say around election time, they're electing my president. So. But uh, with regard to Hawking, um, I, I, it sounds to me like that's a personal personal decision for him. Um, I guess. I guess the thing is that um, the question is whether. You know whether physics delivers a complete world view. I think there's a there's a faction of scientists that uh, hold that physics or their science delivers a complete world view to them, and I think that Hawking is in that category. But not not everybody feels that way. Not everybody, because at this point we were talking about about purpose. It doesn't doesn't give give us purpose. Um, I mean, think about maybe Einstein. So there's a person that uh, 
he was, I think he was reverential in some sense, you know. Um, and I think he felt that a little, a little confused about purpose in the universe because, uh, because there was randomness in the universe. That famous quote about God does not play dice didn't sit well with him. So he, he must have had some other idea that God should be doing something that's not random. So I don't know, I think it's uh, worldviews are formed in many ways and you, not everyone. Some people get their worldview from science, and, but, but certainly not, not everyone. Hi, I read Lawrence Krauss's book and I thought he had a lot of interesting points and I wonder how as a person of faith one can engage someone like that who is an expert in the science but seems to be saying just there is only this and in the multiverses for example we are this way because there were a million other chances and all the other chances failed and this is the one that succeeded. Is there really any place to engage as a person of faith with someone who holds a belief like that? Um, I think so, because, because I, I know plenty of people that understand multiverse ideas. Uh, I, I know people that are, that are string theorists that, um, that work in string theory and they still have the, a, a religious faith. Um, as I said, I think that the idea of first cause still works. Um, Everything that Krauss has written did not change the idea that uh, that you could ascribe to to God the first cause of whatever is. So, from my perspective, um, no matter how esoteric the theory is, it it's not going to be enough to to satisfy the first cause problem. short. Hold on. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, let me just start off by saying I'm not really all that educated in the field of astronomy, but I did have a question I wanted to clear up. Okay. Um, and you can shoot it down if you want to, because I don't really know, but the end kind of suggested that with the whole complexity of the human brain that kind of mirrors the universe, isn't it just possible that we made the whole thing up? Well, it's possible we don't really exist. That's quantum mechanics, right? Well, I mean, well, those things are possible but unprovable. I guess I would say that. Um, and I mean, wh what is it? Let's see, I'm not a philosopher. I need philosoph philosophy help here. What about the logical positivists? Uh, I mean... Doesn't that fit into this question somewhere? I can't quite put my finger on it. Um, well, I mean, yeah. There, um, when you when let's go back to this example of uh, the biblical uh, biblical literalist folks saying that the universe can't be more than six thousand years old, but we know that there are objects out there much farther away sending their light to us, so they have to be older than six thousand years. So what it could come down to is if you want to hold to biblical literalism because it's important to you, you could just say, well, when God created the universe, he created it in its present state with the light already on the way to you. And uh, so I would say that, I would call that the as if idea. You know, the universe is as if it were, was 13.7 billion years old, but it says in this book it's 6,000 years old, and I know that this book is contains absolute truth. So, so you could always resort to the as if part. Although, but that's okay if it helps you philosophically and religiously, but it, it isn't science. Okay. Thanks, I enjoyed that. And I also appreciate the uh, gentleman from Penn State's comment about the mind's eye uh, in terms of what you're and I think that uh, book ends with your initial comment of what is it you're looking for and defining how do you know you've achieved it. But uh, a long time ago, I read a book from a, a, a physics professor. I forgot his name. I think he was from Columbia. But he uh, 
compiled like that woman of uh, Eklund, who the book you'd mentioned about uh, scientists who did not disallow religion. Uh -huh. And uh, he found many examples of just the basic idea of the more they explored, the more cause they had to wonder. And that they were, it, they were not uh, antithetical or, or mm -hmm. hostile yeah. notions, just that the more that was explored and, and discovered led to even greater uh, amazement. Yeah. Thanks. I, I just want one maybe final comment is that um, the, these polar opposites make a lot of noise. And they, they sort of keep, keep the, this, this religion science thing roiling. But as a matter of fact, um, most of us are able to carry on one way or the other. Uh, look at Francis Collins. Look at that bit about 50% of scientists. It's OK with them that there can be a god. Not, not too upset. Um, so we, we sort of manage. But I guess it's, all, it's good for these other people from the extremes to be making noises. So we pay some attention and rethink how we actually feel about those things. I mean, in many respects, our feelings about religion and science are, are still, how would I say, they're very personal. And in many ways, they are probably not even consistent. But that's just the way human beings are. Well, thank you again, Ed. And thank you for your good questions and uh, your good attention. And uh, we're so happy that you were able to be with us tonight. So uh, be sure to come back in the, the fall and uh, encourage people to come to uh, Cabrini and to Pendle Hill uh, to hear these uh, talks over again. All right, have a safe trip home and uh, thank you again. <laughs>